deputy governors, assistant governors, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first apologize for the delay. I'm afraid we got stuck behind some uh, heavy traffic. Uh, my very pleasant duty is to introduce the speaker, the Director of Economic Research, Dr. Yutika Indratna. Uh, but before I do that, let me also place on record appreciation and gratitude to her and her team uh, for the production of the annual report. Uh, as you all know that this is the flagship publication of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. And each year, it, there's an enormous amount of work that is put in, um, primarily by colleagues in the Economic Research Department, but also a number of other departments uh, contribute in a substantive way. So I'd first like to thank all the colleagues who work extremely long hours uh, to get this publication out, which um, I've realized since I've been in this job um, is extremely valuable uh, as a point of reference, um, primarily for students, both uh, A-level and university students. So it's an extremely valuable uh, kind of function that the central bank performs in uh, putting this document together. And uh, I'm privileged now to introduce the speaker, uh, our Director of Economic Research, Dr. Yuthika Indratna. Uh, she has served the Economic Research Department for 17 years in various capacities. In addition, Dr. Indratna has also worked in several other departments in the bank, including the Financial System Stability Department, the Policy Review and Monitoring Department. She has also been designated as Senior Economist to the Governor's Office during the tenure of Governor A.S. Jayavardhana. Dr. Indratna's work experience has been enriched by serving in public institutions outside the bank. She has served as economic advisor to the Ministry of Industries and Investment Promotion. She has also held positions of Director General of Textile Quarter Board and Deputy Director in the Ministry of Finance. Dr. Indratna has also worked as a visiting research economist at the Southeast Asian Center for Central Banks at CSN in KL, Malaysia. She has also represented the Central Bank at several international fora, including investor forums, and as a part of the Sri Lankan delegation at the UN, ECOSOC, and WTO meetings. Dr. Indratna has authored articles in various local and international publications, and she is the editor of the book titled Strengthening Financial Stability Indicators in the Midst of Rapid Financial Innovations, Updates, and Assessment, published by CSN. Her research interests are in the fields of public finance, international economics, and financial stability. Dr. Indratna holds a PhD in economics from the University of London, an MA in economics from the University of Sussex, and a bachelor's degree in economics from Columbia University in New York, USA. It's with great pleasure now that I invite the Director of Economic Research, Dr. Indratna, to present her report. Thank you, Governor, for those kind words of introduction. Uh, Governor, of the Central Bank, Deputy Governors, Assistant Governors, Central Bank colleagues, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I would like to thank the Director, Center for Banking Studies, for granting me this opportunity to deliver this presentation on the state of the economy as reflected in the Annual Report 2017. This is the 68th annual report of the Monetary Board of the Central Bank, published in accordance to Section 35 of the Monetary Law Act. This time we produced two volumes for the annual report. Volu volume one contains the state of the economy, an analysis of the state of the economy along with the statistical data tables. Volume two contains part two, part three, and part four. Part two gives the accounts and operations of the central bank. Part three, the administrative measures adopted by the government and the monetary board relating to the functions and operations of the central bank and banking institutions. Part four contains major legislative enactments of 2017, again relating to the functions and operations of the 
central bank and banking institutions. Um, this will be the outline of my presentation. I will first provide a snapshot of the economy, then move on to detailed uh, sectoral developments, starting with the real sector, then going on to the monetary, external, fiscal, and financial sectors. Then I will talk about the medium-term outlook as given in the annual report, issues and policies mentioned in the report, and also the box articles that are there uh, in the report. Uh, starting with the snapshot of the Sri Lankan economy in 2017, the economy showed greater stability in 2017 with notable improvements in macroeconomic indicators. This was a result of measures taken by the central bank and the government. With regard to monetary policy, a tight monetary policy stance was maintained in 2017. Real and nominal interest rates were at high levels. However, the growth of monetary aggregates and private sector credit decelerated uh, responding to the tight monetary policy stance. In the fiscal sector, revenue-based fiscal consolidation continued, tax revenue increased, while expenditure declined. The primary balance recorded a surplus due to revenue exceeding non-interest expenditure. However, the budget deficit increased due to higher interest payments and lower non-tax revenue. And central government debt to GDP ratio declined. In the external sector, imports outpaced the growth in exports. The current account deficit widened. Inflows to the financial account improved to record an overall BOP surplus. Gross official reserves increased to US dollars 8 billion. And the Sri Lankan rupee remained relatively stable. In the financial sector, capital adequacy and liquidity ratios in the banking sector were maintained at healthy levels. A moderation in licensed finance companies and specialized leasing companies performance was observed. The stock market performance improved in 2017. Core inflation decelerated, responding to monetary policy measures. Double digit food inflation kept headline inflation high. Inflation, however, reverted to mid-single-digit levels in early 2018. The unemployment rate declined, and labor force participation rate improved. However, real economic growth remained subdued. Real GDP growth moderated in 2017. Agriculture sector activity contracted due to adverse weather and spillover effects affected the growth in industry and services activity. Star uh, moving on to real sector developments, economic growth moderated to 3.1% in 2017, as mentioned earlier. The direct and impact of adverse weather conditions and spillover effects hampered growth in 2017. Agriculture activities contracted although a recovery was observed in quarter four. Although industry and services activities contributed positively, the growth momentum slowed down compared to the previous year. Economic growth was supported by the expansion in both consumption and investment expenditure. Consumption expenditure, which accounted for se nearly 71% of GDP, grew by 9% with increased consumption in both private and gov government sectors. Investment expenditure grew by 16.6%, decelerating from the expansion of 22% in 2016, with the slowdown in investment on construction activity. However, net external demand continued to negatively affect economic growth in 2017 with the continued trade deficit. Domestic savings and national savings as a percentage of GDP increased to 29.3% and 33.9% respectively in 2017. Per capita GDP 
increased to US dollars 4,065 in 2017. Development of economic and social infrastructure continued amidst tight bud budgetary conditions to enhance a country's competitiveness and accelerate growth. Construction of expressways, highways, and regional roads, ports, and airport development activities progressed. The government continued to invest in social infrastructure, improving health and education services. Given fiscal constraints, the government needs to encourage private sector participation in infrastructure development while ensuring quality of infrastructure and healthy competition among private sector participants. Investment in economic infrastructure supported the improved performance of airport, port, and telecommunication related services. Total cargo handling in 2017 increased by 8.5%. Container handli handling increased by 8.3%. And transshipment container handling recorded a growth of 8.8%. Telephone penetration increased by 5.8% to 143.6%. And internet penetration increased by 18.6% to 27.5%. The government continued to improve health and education services. Several initiatives were taken to prevent and control acute and chronic non-communicable diseases. Sri Lanka experienced outbreaks of several communicable diseases, including record levels of incidents and deaths related to the dengue epidemic. Measures taken to improve the quality of general education while reducing disparities across schools included the 13 years of guaranteed education policy that, and the nearest school is the best school concept uh, adopted by the government and the government also continued to monitor uh, quality standards. Private sector involvement in the provision of tertiary education needs to be encouraged along with appropriate regulations and a quality assurance process across all disciplines of studies. The country faced challenges in meeting the energy requirement due to both domestic and external factors. Increased electricity demand was met through thermal power generation. Electricity generation and sales increased in 2017. Generation increased by 3.7%, while sales grew by 5%. Despite the rising trend in global oil prices, domestic demand for petroleum products continued to increase. Growth in petroleum sales to the power generation sector increased by 20.7%. The transportation sector, there was an increase of 4.9%. And to the aviation sector, petroleum sales increased by 7.4%. The timely implementation of the least cost long-term generation expansion plan is vital to ensure energy security as well as the financial viability of the CEB. The unemployment rate continued to fall to 4.2% in 2017 from 4.4% in 2016, declining the female unemployment rate to 6.5% supported the fall in overall unemployment. Labor force participation rate improved to 54.1% in 2017 from 53.8% in 2016. Female labor force participation rate increased to 36.6% while the male labor force participation rate fell to 74.5%. The number of employed persons increased by 3.3% to 8.2 million in 2017, which included 1.2 million public sector employees. If you look at the employment by economic activity, the, agri uh, the agriculture sector employ employed 26.1% of the labor force, the industry sector 28.4%, and services 45.5%. 
Poverty levels declined across all sectors, while the government continued with social welfare programs in 2017. The overall poverty level declined to 4.1%. However, income disparity, existence of severe pover poverty pockets, and economically vulnerable groups living just above the po poverty line remain social issues. Social safety nets and poverty reduction programs need to be strengthened further to better target the underprivileged segments. Moving on to monetary sector developments, the central bank continued to maintain its tight monetary policy stance in 2017. Monetary tightening commenced at the end of 2015, and in 2016, we had two instances where we increased the policy rates. In 2017, policy rates were increased by 25 basis points. In April 2017, uh, we reduced the SLFR rate by 25 basis points, uh, starting easing of the monetary policy. This was done considera considering the mon moderation in inflation, inflation outlook, and low real GDP growth. Macroprudential measures such as the LTV and the more market-based exchange rate policy also complemented the conduct of monetary policy. In 2017, the central bank made progress towards implementing a flexible inflation targeting framework by 2020. Fiscal discipline with continued fiscal consolidation is a crucial prerequisite for the successful implementation of FIT. In response to monetary tightening and changing liquidity conditions, most market interest rates adjusted upwards in 2017 the AW CMR hovered around the upper bound of the standing rate corridor till mid-July 2017 and declined thereafter to stabilize in the middle of the corridor. Deposit interest rates increased but moderated somewhat by end 2017. Lending interest rates of commercial banks rose and stabilized at high levels. Increased yields on garment securities declined during the second half of 2017 with improvements to government finances and the new auction system. Growth of money supply decelerated to desired levels by end 2017. Reserve money expanded moderately in 2017. Broad money growth remained high during most of the year and gradually decelerated by the end of 2017. Domestic credit expansion mainly contributed to the monetary expansion, although at a declining rate. The buildup of net foreign assets contributed positively to monetary expansion. Credit to the government continued to increase while credit to public corporations also rose despite repayments by key SOBs. NCG by the banking sector increased by rupees 196.4 billion compared to an increase of rupees 212.6 billion in 2016. A significant expansion in NCG from commercial banks was observed. However, NCG from the central bank contracted as reflected in the reduction in treasury bill holdings. Credit to state-owned business enterprises increased by rupees 19.2 billion in 2017 as against a decline of rupees 27.9 billion in 2016. Private sector credit growth continued to decelerate during the year, reaching desired levels by end 2017. Credit extended to the private sector grew by rupees 617.4 billion in 2017, with year on year growth at 14.7 by the end of the year. Credit to all major sectors of the economy grew at a slower pace 
in comparison to 2016, except for personal loans and advances. Credit to the services and industry sectors expanded by 8.3% and 19.6%. Credit to agriculture and fisheries sectors grew by 14.1%. Personal loans and advances increased by 18.5%. Responding to monetary policy measures, core inflation stabilized while headline inflation remained broadly above targeted levels in 2017. Headline inflation increased due to sharp acceleration in food inflation caused by weather-related supply disruptions base effect arising from government tax adjustments in 2016, high and higher commodity prices in the global market. However, inflation moderated towards the end of the year with the decline in food inflation. Core inflation also declined to low single digit levels. During the first quarter of 2018, headline inflation continued its moderation while co-inflation remains subdued. Moving on to external sector developments. This slide shows Sri Lanka's external sector indicators uh, at a glance. The trade deficit increased to 11% of GDP in 2017. The current account deficit also increased 2.6% of GDP. However, the overall balance recorded a surplus of US dollars 2 billion and gross official reserves increased to nearly US dollars 8 billion. Although the balance of payments improved in overall terms, a key concern in 2017 was the increase in the current account deficit. As you all know, the a key component of the current account deficit is the trade account. So let me take you through developments in the trade account. Exports rebounded strongly in 2017, recording historical high levels. Made significant increases in exports were seen in textiles and garment, petroleum products, rubber products, tea, spices, and seafood. Strong growth in export earnings was underpinned by the restoration of the EU GSP plus facility, recovery in external demand, increased commodity prices in the international market, conducive external trade policies with strong institutional support, and the flexible exchange rate policy of the central bank. The restoration of the EU GSP plus facility benefited mostly textiles and garments and seafood. Expenditure on imports also increased substantially, reflecting the effects of adverse weather conditions and firming of international commodity prices. Adverse weather conditions necessitated higher imports of fuel for thermal power generation and higher rice imports to meet the shortage in domestic production. Gold imports also increased significantly to US dollars 650 million in 2017. Weather induced imports and gold offset the rebound in exports, expanding the trade deficit in 2017. The trade deficit widened to US dollars 9.6 billion as a percentage of GDP, the deficit increased to 11% in 2017. However, the terms of trade improved as the export price index increased at a higher rate than the import price index. Western countries continued to be the main destinations for Sri Lanka's exports, while Asia dominated Sri Lanka's imports, USA, was the single largest buyer of Sri Lankan exports, accounting for 26% of total export earnings. And India was the main source of imports for Sri Lanka, accounting for 22% of total import expenditure. 
The services account recorded a surplus in 2017, driven by tourist earnings. Major contributors to the surplus in the services account were tourism, transport services, and telecommunication, computer, and information services. Tourist earnings increased to US dollars 3,925 million with an annual growth of 11.6%. Tourist arrivals crossed the 2 million mark for the second consecutive year. India, China, and the UK continued to be key, the key source markets. With regard to transport services, inflows to the transport sector registered a growth of 5.6%. And earnings in the telecommunications, computer, and information services sector increased by 7.8%. Remittances, however, declined, and the primary income account deficit widened. Worker remittances declined by 1.1% to US dollars 7,164 million. The downward trend in remittances can be attributed to geopolitical uncertainties in the Middle Eastern region, declining labor migration under all skill categories. The government also took policy measures to discourage, mi discourage migration of housemaids and unskilled workers. And there was also expansion in the domestic employment opportunities, which also impacted remittances adversely. The primary income account deficit widened to US dollars 2,355 million in 2017. Major reasons for the expansion of the deficit in the primary account included reinvested earnings by direct investment enterprises, coupon payments on ISBs, and interest payments on foreign loans obtained by the government. These developments expanded the current account deficit in 2017. The current account deficit widened to US dollars 2,309 million in 2017. As a percentage of GDP, the current account deficit was 2.6%. The deficit widened due to deterioration in the trade balance, higher deficit in primary income account, and moderate earnings from tourism and the decline in remittances. The financial account, which was under pressure during the first quarter of 2017 due to foreign exchange outflows, improved thereafter with substantial in inflows. Main inflows included foreign direct investments, portfolio investments, and loans to government. FDI in 2017 was US dollars 1,913 million, which is a record figure so far. Portfolio investments to the, uh, portfolio investments included net foreign inflows to the CSC amounting to US dollars 359 million in 2017. Investments to the treasury bill and bond market which amounted to US dollars 441 million in 2017. And we also got an international sovereign bond amounting to US dollars 1.5 billion in 2017. Uh, loans to government uh, in the form of the foreign currency term financing facility amounted to US dollars 1 billion last year. We also received the third and fourth tranches from the IMF EFF facility, amounting to US dollars 419 million. We have so far received US dollars 760 million from this facility. The EFF facility strengthened the BOP and supported the reform agenda of the government. The combined outcome of, current and of the current and financial account resulted in an increase in international reserves and a surplus in the BOP. Gross official reserves in 2000, at the end of 2017 was US dollars 8 billion, equivalent to 4.6 months of imports and covering 63% of short-term debt and liabilities. 
the overall balance of the the overall balance in the BOP uh, was a surplus of US dollars 2.1 billion in 2017. Sri Lanka's external debt rose mainly due to higher foreign borrowings of the government. Total external debt increased by US dollars 5.4 billion to US dollars 51.8 billion by end 2017. Total outstanding external debt as a percentage of GDP increased to 59.5% from 56.8% in the previous year. Total external debt servicing amounted to US dollars 4.6 billion in 2017. The Sri Lankan rupee depreciated against the US dollar by 2% in 2017, under a more market-based exchange rate policy, the rupee experienced depreciation pressure during the first two months of 2017, but subsequent inflows reduced the pressure on the exchange rate. Central bank intervention was limited to absorption of foreign exchange. Net absorption in 2017 was US dollars 1,664 million. The five currency and the 24 currency rear indices depreciated, reflecting some improvement in the country's competitiveness. Moving on to the fiscal sector. This slide shows Sri Lanka's fiscal sector indicators at a glance. I will mention some key uh, indicators, tax revenue increased to 12.6% of GDP in 2017. Total expenditure decreased to 19.4% of GDP. The current account balance, however, increased from 0.6% of GDP to a deficit of 0.7% in 2017. The primary balance however, was in surplus. The overall budget balance, however, increased to a deficit of 5.5% in 2017 from 5.4% in the previous year. Central government debt decreased to 77.6% of GDP from 78.8% in the previous year. The primary balance recorded a marginal surplus in 2017 after several decades, although the budget deficit and the current account deficit increased marginally. The primary balance surplus was rupees 2.1 billion. The primary balance of the budget reflects the difference between revenue and non-interest expenditure. A surplus in the primary balance shows that the entire non-interest expenditure of the government was met out of revenue receipts with a net surplus remaining. The current account deficit, which indicates the government's dis-savings, however, increased to 0.7% of GDP in 2017 from 0.6%, and the budget deficit increased marginally to 5.5% of GDP in 2017. Several revenue enhancing measures were taken by the government in 2017, while initiatives already implemented continued. The government streamlined and simplified the tax system through broadening tax bases, rationalizing tax exemptions and concessions. This was done through uh, the enactment of the New Inland Revenue Act, number 24 of 2017, reducing the liable threshold for e economic service charge and imposing the ESC on the importation of motor vehicles, introducing excise duty on raw materials used for the production of ethanol and upward revision of excise duty rates on liquor, and the removal of several exemptions granted under the NBT. A tax expenditure statement was submitted to the parliament for the first time through the budget 2017 to improve fiscal transparency. There were also improvements to tax administration 
through automation of work processes at the revenue agencies. This included the Revenue Administration Management Information System, or RAMIS, at the Inland Revenue Department, the National Single Window at the Sri Lanka Customs, and the Integrated Treasury Management Information System, or ITMIS, at the Ministry of Finance and Mass Media. Looking at the indicators, ta uh, detailed indicators, the tax revenue as a percentage of GDP increased, although total revenue declined. Tax revenue increased to 12.6% of GDP in 2017 from 12.3% in 2016. This was, the increase was largely com came from collection from VAT, excise duty on petroleum products, economic service charge, SCL, PAL, and the NBT. Nevertheless, total revenue declined to 13.8% of GDP in 2017 due to the reduction in non-tax revenue, such as dividend transfers from major state-owned business enterprises. Government expenditure as a percentage of GDP declined during the year with expenditure rationalization measures. Expenditure and net lending as a percentage of GDP declined to 19.4% in 2017 from 19.6% in the previous year due to the reduction in recurrent expenditure. Recurrent expenditure reduced to 14.5% of GDP in 2017 from 14.8% in the previous year. Subdued growth in salaries and wages and current transfers and subsidies was largely the reason for this. However, interest payments increased to 5.5% of GDP in 2017 from 5.1% in 2016. Public investment as a percentage of GDP declined marginally to 4.9% in 2017 from 5% in the previous year. The financial performance of major state-owned business enterprises showed a mixed performance in 2017. Drought conditions and rising global oil prices deteriorated the financial performance of the CEB and CPC, although the CPC recorded an overall profit of rupees 5.1 billion. The weak financial performance of the SOBEs in the energy sector highlights the importance of adopting cost-reflective pricing strategies, particularly for petroleum and electricity. In July 2017, the SLPA and the government entered into a concession agreement with the China M Merchant Port Holdings Company to develop the Hambantota port. Requests for proposals were also called for consultancy services to restructure the Sri Lankan airlines. The government relied mainly on foreign sources to finance the budget deficit. Foreign financing accounted for 3.3% of GDP as in the previous year, while domestic financing was 2.2% of GDP. In terms of domestic financing, the banking sector contributed rupees 187.7 billion towards funding the deficit, while the contribution from non-bank sources declined to rupees 61.8 billion. Central bank financing of the budget deficit recorded a repayment of rupees 187.9 billion, while commercial banks funded the budget deficit to the tune of rupees 375.7 billion. The central government debt to GDP ratio declined in 2017. The central government debt stock stood at rupees 10,313 billion at the end of 2017. Central government debt as a percentage of GDP, however, declined to 77.6% as at end 2017 from 78.8% at the end of 2016. This was due to the deceleration in the growth of debt accumulation and the increase in the nominal GDP. Central government debt service payments increased in 2017 
debt service payments increased by 18.5% to rupees 1603 billion in 2017 due to increases in both amortization and interest payments amortization payments increased by 17% to rupees 867.5 billion while interest payments increased by 20.4% to rupees 735.6 billion in 2017. Uh, moving on to the financial sector, in the banking sector, high asset growth gradually moderated during the second half due to tight monetary policy. Banking sector assets surpassed rupees 10 trillion in 2017, while deposits marked rupees 7.4 trillion. There was a decline in non-performing loans. Capital adequacy ratios and the liquidity ratios were maintained at healthy levels. Profitability improved. In the licensed finance company and specialized leasing company sector, the performance moderated with low credit growth, declining profitability, and increase in non-performing loans. A diversification of the loan portfolio was observed in response to the implementation of fiscal and macroprudential policy measures. Financial markets remained volatile in line with the changing local and global economic environment. The stock market performance improved in 2017. The all share price index increased by 2.3% to 6,369.3 points at the end of 2017. Total net foreign inflows to the CSC improved to US dollars 279 million in 2017 from US dollars 19 million in 2016. The regulatory framework was strengthened with the introduction of prudential measures with a view to enhancing the safety and resilience of the financial sector in Sri Lanka. Now I would like to present to you the medium-term outlook that we have um, in the annual report. This shows the medium-term macroeconomic framework for the period 2018 to 2022. In the real sector, GDP growth is expected to increase to 5% in 2018 and gradually improve to around 6% thereafter. In the monetary sector, monetary aggregates are expected to be maintained in line with the economic activity. In the external sector, the external sector is projected to strengthen over the medium term with improvements to the trade and services accounts. In the fiscal sector, revenue-based fiscal consolidation is expected to reduce the budget deficit and debt levels in the medium term. Although Sri Lanka has made progress towards greater macroeconomic stability through the adoption of appropriate policy measures, its growth performance was not at desired levels, highlighting the urgent need to implement structural reforms to address deterrence to growth. Therefore, in the annual uh, report, we have mentioned some issues and policies mainly in the first chapter. There is a need to commercialize agriculture. The agriculture policy focus needs to gradually shift towards empowering farmers to engage in commercially viable activities. The, there needs to be a cost-reflective pricing strategy for energy. Moving towards a more cost-reflective pricing strategy for energy not only ensures the financial viability of SOBs, but also promotes the efficient use of energy in production and consumption. We have also mentioned, uh, talked about the quality assurance and accreditation of private education. The quality assurance and accreditation of private education services needs to need to be strengthened further to support the healthy growth of this sector. Exports also need to be, uh, ex there should be an export enhancement through diversification. The expansion of exports through diversification is of utmost importance to ensure external sector stability. We also need to address 
the low FDI inflows in comparison to our regional peers, strengthening the investment policy framework with a view to creating a conducive environment, environment for FDIs is a necessity. We also need to enhance the direct tax revenue by strengthening tax administration, while the commitment to increase gov government revenue through tax reforms has yielded results, there is further space to enhance the direct tax revenue by strengthening tax administration through ICT to bring in tax invaders into the ne tax net. Better ma management of public debt is also a necessity. The speedy implementation of liability management activities is imperative to manage risks associated with maturing foreign currency debt. And we also need to deal with the challenges of a digital economy. A myriad of opportunities for an expanding digital economy needs to be enhanced through the strengthening of the current regulatory and legislative framework. These are only some of the issues and policies that we have uh, discussed due to time constraints. Avoiding frequent reversals of policy decisions is essential to reinforce trust in public policy making and strengthen stability in social and economic spheres. Frequently changing decisions will lead to more public dissatisfaction and tarnish government credibility while inviting more disruptive lobbying for continuous changes. Uncertainty about the durability of policy decisions taken would affect economic decisions of the private sector, which could have a lasting effect on the economy. Encouraging evidence-based decision-making and ensuring consensus amongst decision-makers before a policy is adopted, while sufficient time for a policy to operate must be allowed before a revision is considered. Several existing and emerging challenges need to be addressed for the country to achieve high economic growth and sustainable economic development over the medium term. Whilst the commitment of the government is essential to implement the in envisaged reforms, increased private sector participation in productive economic activity is also vital in the country's progress as a middle-income economy. Proactive policy measures implemented in a timely manner with increased consistency would facilitate improved welfare of the general public in the country. We have also several box articles in the annual report. There is a box on petroleum price reforms, which discusses the need for the reintroduction of a pricing formula for petroleum products. Uh, while highlighting the macroeconomic issues and repercussions of a non-cost reflective administered fuel pricing strategy. I think this, uh, the government has done uh, revised petroleum prices. This has partly been done for petroleum prices. There is also a bo box article on disaster management for a resilient economy, which discusses the importance of implementing a comprehensive disaster management plan strategies that build coping capacities, reduce exposure and susceptibility, and improve the adaptation to impending disasters. There is a box article on measuring inflation expectations, which discusses how the central bank measures inflation expectations, the results of the inflation expectations survey carried out the, by the central bank. Compilation of international trade statistics under the standard international trade classification is, a, is another box article that's going in the annual report this time. This box article uh, explains the standard international trade classification, which is an internationally accepted and standardized method of trade statistics classification. SITC helps international comparability of trade statistics and the central bank has commenced compiling the trade statistics based on SITC 2017. Further liberalization of the foreign exchange transactions under the Foreign Exchange Act number 12 of 2017 is another box article that is there in the annual report. 
This box article highlights the salient features of the Foreign Exchange Act number 12 of 2017, including the areas of administration of the Act, powers of the Minister, persons authorized to deal in foreign exchange and permitted transactions, regulations, orders, and directions issued under the FEA are also outlined in this box article. There is also a bo box article on fiscal rules. Fiscal rules are necessary for long-term fiscal sustainability and, and solvency. Therefore, it is timely to revise the Fiscal Management Responsibility Act to incorporate binding fiscal rules with, proper, with a proper enforcement mechanism. Uh, we have introduced, the central bank has introduced a new issuance system for treasury bonds in 2017. So this box article uh, discusses the new issuance system for treasury bonds, rep which replaced the fully auction-based issuance system. Uh, the new issuance system has been introduced in response to a strong need for an efficient and transparent, transparent issuance system in line with international best practices. There is also a box article uh, on the management of structural liquidity. Monetary policy is implemented by managing liquidity in the interbank market. This article provides a clear explanation of the concept of structural liquidity, factors determining liquidity, and to tools de deployed to manage it. We also have a box article on the adoption of SLFRS 9, Financial Instruments by Banks in Sri Lanka. The, uh, the, this box article provides an outline on the adoption of the new accounting standard in the Sri Lankan context and evaluates its impact on the banking sector, highlighting the rationale, benefits, challenges, and supervisory expectations of the regulator. There is also a box article on the future of banking driven by technology. The banking sector is transforming to digital banking as disruptive technologies challenge the traditional banking models. So there is a need to strengthen the resilience of the banking sector to technology risk. Introduction of the Financial Customer Protection Framework for licensed finance companies and specialized leasing companies is another box article that we have put in our annual report this time. This article discusses the salient features of the Financial Customer Protection Framework introduced by the Department of Supervision of Non-Bank Financial Institutions in January 2018, uh, which is in effect from April 2018. The framework was issued with the objective of protecting the rights and interests of cus customers and to strengthen customer confidence. Major economic policy changes and measures are also discussed in a box article. This box article outlines the major economic policy changes and measures introduced in 2017 with respect to monetary policy, financial sector, foreign exchange management, price revisions, tax revisions, government expenditure and debt management. Aligning governance and enterprise-wide risk management in central banks is another box article we have in our annual report. Many central banks around the globe have strengthened their risk management functions by adopting enterprise-wide risk management frameworks in which high priority has been given to highest governance standards. The Central Bank of Sri Lanka has also made initiatives to adopt an ERM framework which facilitates internationally accepted governance standards. Before I conclude my presentation, I would la like to thank the governor Dr. Indrajit Kumar Swami and members of the Monetary Board for their, for their immense support and guidance at all times. I would also like to thank the Senior Deputy Governor, Deputy Governors, and all the assistant governors for their 
contribution and support in the preparation of the annual report. My thanks also go to department heads and their staff for the continuous support in compiling the annual report. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank all ministries, government institutions, including the Department of Census and Statistics and other private institutions for providing information and data. I extend my gratitude to my staff at the Economic Research Department for their unstinted support and utmost commitment in putting the annual report together, as well as this presentation. And I thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your presence here to you today and your patient hearing. Thank you once again.